Welcome. I'm Sue Rovins, co-host of Ye Old Terror Inn. As you step through the creaking door into our humble abode, you'll find all the comforts and safety of home. Warm soup, a blanket, tea, perhaps something stronger as the tales are told. Despair is a powerful emotion. It will eat you alive if you let it. Tonight's story, Spoons, is about a woman trapped in a dreadful marriage. How far will she go to end her suffering? When you turn in for the night, dear traveler, leave a light on, for the shadows here are long and far-reaching, and the darkness is ever-present at Ye Old Terror Inn. The idea had already been floating around in my brain by the time I heard my alarm go off. I stayed in bed and pretended to be asleep, listening, as he gathered his things and left for work. I waited until I heard the truck pull away before getting out of bed. I didn't want any confrontations today or any day. I didn't even want to look at him again, not with what I had planned to do. Once I knew he was truly off the premises, I breathed a sigh of relief. I was alone. Well, I wasn't actually alone, per se. My two cats kept me company. It was just that the thought of him being out of the house and physically away from me was comforting. I stood in the hallway, debating if I should call into work and tell them I wasn't feeling well, or just go in and suck it up for another endless day. The thought of taking a shower, getting dressed, and driving to my job made me exhausted. I could picture myself sitting at my desk, ghosting through my job, forcing small talk in the elevator, moving blindly through the entire day, as if I weren't connected to my own body. Having to sludge through eight hours only to come home to the hell that waited for me was overwhelming. It was 7.45 a.m. I was supposed to be at work by 8.30. Even if I skipped the shower and threw my clothes on from yesterday, I would barely make it. I decided to call in sick. I still hadn't made any definitive plans at that point but I didn't have the energy to rush through a morning routine and then arrive late to work on top of it. I went into the bathroom. The stark whiteness of the walls matched my pale, sullen complexion. I stared into the mirror and hated what I saw. It wasn't a critical commentary about my physical appearance, but rather a reflection of despair. The misery and emptiness were unyielding. My 32-year-old face looked aged and worn. I toyed with the idea of taking a shower for no other reason than to clear my head, but it felt like too much effort. Instead, I hoisted myself up onto the bathroom counter next to the sink and rested my head against my knees. I had made it this far in the day, almost a whole hour of wakefulness without crying, but the tearless moments were slipping away. Sobs welled up from my gut as I blinked back tears, not wanting them to come. I knew that if I started to cry, there would be no reason to stop. Finally, they came, streaming down my face, warm against my skin. I couldn't hold it in any longer. At the same time, one of the cats jumped up and rubbed against my leg. I reached out to pet her, thankful for the attention. I wondered who would take care of the cats. He certainly wouldn't. He barely took notice of me, his wife. There would be no way in hell he'd spend a moment out of his day caring for my cats. 
I picked up the bottle of antidepressants that were next to me on the counter. I had just renewed the prescription a couple of days before, so the bottle was almost full. It would be so easy. One pill at a time, until they were gone. I thought about writing a note, but how on earth would I explain the past 10 years? A note like that could go on forever. It would be a pretty weak summary of how horrible and worthless he made me feel every single day. While it was true that he never hit me, his choice of words, his constant condescension and the public criticisms had worn me down over time. During the first few years, I foolishly believed the confrontations and disagreements between us were just a matter of two different personalities trying to iron out relationship wrinkles. But he was a quick study in the art of degradation. And what little self-esteem I had at the beginning of our time together had completely vanished by the third year. If I were stronger, if I spoke up more, if I knew how to stand up for myself, all of these ifs never made a bit of difference. I was who I was and didn't know any better at the time. I shook the plastic bottle and opened the lid. More tears flowed and I set the bottle back down. I buried my head against my knees again. My brain reeled back and forth. In one moment, I almost felt a thread of strength and dignity, but in the very next, I couldn't imagine living one more hour under these circumstances. The most recent wrench thrown into this nightmare of a relationship was the possibility of being pregnant with this man's child. It was the most revolting conundrum I had ever faced. I was a week late already and had what I believed were early symptoms. We never talked about having kids. We never talked about much of anything. We didn't even have sex all that often. It was like one of these unspoken rules. If it was Friday night and he wasn't busy doing something else, the maritable obligation or expectation was probably going to be fulfilled. I went downstairs to the kitchen to get a large glass of water. I never could swallow pills dry. As I stood at the sink, my eyes drifted to a white plastic serving spoon in a ceramic jar, which sat next to the stove. My stomach cramped as I plucked it out of the container and held it. There was nothing unique about it. It was a simple, long-handled spoon, one that could be found in a department store's kitchen section for about a buck and a half. I gripped the handle in one hand and the bowl in the other and snapped it in two. Shards of plastic flew against the kitchen window. A large piece scuttled across the vinyl floor and came to a rest near a broom that leaned in the corner. He had given me that spoon for my last birthday. The year before that, my gift was the red plastic serving spoon which sat in the same jar next to the oven. Every birthday since the time he and I began dating over a decade ago was marked with a similar spoon as a present. He would hand me a crinkled brown paper bag without a card accompanying it and say, Happy birthday. The routine was always the same. After giving it to me, he would stand there waiting for me to thank him for being so considerate. When we were first dating, I thought this spoon ceremony was kind of funny, sort of a private joke between the two of us. But then it went on for a second year and then a third and then it wasn't funny anymore. It was sad and pathetic and heartbreaking. When I asked him if this was really my birthday present, my real present, and not just a gag gift, he looked me square in the eye and said, of course it was. Apparently, it was my fault for having made an offhand comment about needing to buy some spoons for my apartment when we had first met. 
he was clearing $50,000, and that was during the first half of the marriage. He never let me see his pay stubs after his company gave him his first raise, but I was certain that money was never a problem for him. I wasn't looking for an extravagant present. I never thought of myself as an extravagant person. But I had hoped, year after year, for something more than a plastic spoon from a discount store. I wandered into the bathroom. I hadn't fully committed to my idea yet, so I was aimlessly drifting from one room to the next. I stared at the bed, our bed, which was set dead center in the middle of the room between the two windows. The blankets were bunched up in a crumpled ball, and one of the cats was perched on top of the lump of material. <laughs> I forced a smile. Being intimate with me was never a priority for him, but he was certainly quick to notice beautiful women when we were out. The times we were intimate felt forced and smacked of obligation. On the third night, after we were married, a creepy little spider was crawling up the wall on my side of the bed. I have always been afraid of them, so I asked my new husband, who was next to me in the bed reading, if he would kill it. His response was to slam his book shut and throw it across the room. Why can't you do anything yourself? He yelled right before he took my pillow and threw it at the spider. I watched in horror and disgust as both arachnid and pillow slid down the wall to the floor. Three days, I thought. It was in that precise moment when I realized that my life had spun out of control, that I was just beginning the downward spiral into depression and despair. The crumb of self-esteem I had was crushed under the weight of his pointed and vile accusation. This is what my life had become. I walked into the smallest room of the house, the den, or my computer room, as he referred to it. He spent most of his time in front of the machine. This included lunch, dinner, and a large portion of most weekends. My own desk had been crowded into a corner, tucked away from his sprawl. I paid the household bills sitting at that desk. For my annual salary of $16,000, a real pittance compared to his, I put in my half towards all the bills. This often left me with no money until my next paycheck. I had holes in my jeans and pairs of shoes that were worn through, yet he never offered as much as a single dime to help me replace anything. He, however, had plenty of money to afford week-long trips for himself, which he took three or four times a year. He and his friends would charter boats, hike in the mountains, or go on scuba diving vacations. I don't know for a fact if the other wives went along, but from some of the pictures I saw, there looked to be a fair representation of women in attendance. For a moment, I sat at my desk and looked at the pile of bills. I started crying again, burdened with the thought of divorce and how that was not a viable option for me, especially if I was pregnant. I knew myself well enough to know that I couldn't raise a child on my own, financially or otherwise. I felt sick, trapped, broke, and desperate. I got up from my desk, went back into the bathroom, and opened the bottle of pills. I lined up each yellow tablet next to one another and silently counted them. 54. Three days shy of a full bottle. I looked up and saw my reflection in the large bathroom mirror. Hair unkempt, face reddened and wet, I couldn't help but believe with everything in my being that this was the only way out of my living hell. I pulled down a paper cup from the holder that was attached to the wall. I filled it with cold water and swallowed it quickly. I remembered having read about this particular drug's overdose reactions and knew what to expect. Everything would slow down. My heart rate, my breathing, 
and my ability to think. Next, shaking and chills would set in. The capacity to warm up, regardless of how many blankets were piled on, would be gone. I might throw up. Eventually, I would just fade off to sleep. In a very broad sense, all of that sounded more peaceful than being kicked and shoved over the edge of the bed every night because I might accidentally touch him while we slept. It also sounded better than being verbally attacked because I bought a $3 garbage can for the kitchen without consulting him first. I filled the cup again and stared at the line of medication in front of me. As I reached for the first pill, I felt a drip down my inner thigh. My period had just begun. An ambulance and a town fire truck sped down the street and stopped in front of the house. Flashing lights and loud sirens coaxed neighbors to investigate from the safety of their porches and front windows. Three EMTs and one fireman hustled to the door wheeling a black cot and carrying large bags of medical supplies. They knocked and rang the doorbell simultaneously. I stumbled to the door in order to open it, but one EMT was already pushing his way in. Are you the one who called for an ambulance? I nodded. Are you the individual needing assistance? I started crying and mumbled incoherently. I felt lightheaded and swooned backwards. The fireman caught me before I collapsed to the floor. He led me over to the couch and sat down next to me. The others gathered around. Can you tell us what the problem is? Upstairs. What? What's upstairs? He... He... He just... I choked out. He? There's someone else in the home? The man asked. He grabbed for his two-way radio and glanced up the stairs. My husband, he... He just fainted. I didn't know what to do. The three EMTs bolted up the stairs and left me on the couch. The firemen opened the front door and went outside to clear the way. I could hear snippets of conversations, bags opening, procedures being tried. Minutes later, I watched as they carried him down the stairs on the gurney, an oxygen mask over his face. One of the EMTs came over to me. We're taking him to St. Thomas. You can follow us in your car or ride in the ambulance, but we're leaving this minute. Thank you. I'll get my things and meet you at the hospital. He nodded and left to join the others in the ambulance. I went to close the door and noticed all of the neighbors still standing around, slack-jawed, straining their necks to get a glimpse of some good old-fashioned tragedy for their evening's entertainment. I went into the kitchen, turned on the hot water, and picked up the sponge. The blender had been soaking all day. I washed it and set it in the dish rack to air dry. Then I took his empty glass from the sink, the one that held the milkshake with the crushed up pills, and cleaned it out as well. Ye Old Terror Inn is owned and produced by Carol M. Ford Productions. All rights reserved. No portion of this podcast may be used without permission. Spoons was written by author Sue Rovins and is copyrighted to the author. Sue's inspiration did not stray far from home. 90% of the story was real, based on her first marriage. The ending, of course, is pure fiction. Beware of a writer's retribution. They will eventually create a character based on you in a story and kill you. For archived episodes of this podcast, visit yeoldterrorin.com. That's ye old with an e, terrorin.com. You can also subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, our hosting site Spreaker, and everywhere podcasts are found. Authors, do you have a story you'd like to submit for consideration for production? Podcasters, do you want to participate in an episode or promote your show and our podcast? Visit our website, yeoldterrorin.com, for more information.